of all the blessings in my life, I suppose one of the biggest blessings is this. I'm going to church nearly all of my life. I can hear you saying, what, is that a blessing? And for you, maybe it wasn't a blessing. Maybe it wasn't a blessing because you didn't go to church when you were a child. Or maybe the church experience that you had was, church was very boring, very strict, very restrictive. And I'm not saying that church for me as a child was not restrictive, was not strict, and was never boring. <laughs> no, it was all of those things quite often. But church was just a part of our life as a family. It was what we did. It was where we went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and any other kind of activity, any kind of meeting that was going to take place with respect to the church, I was going to be a part of that because, you see, I was part of this family I grew up in, and the family was part of the church, which would have been normal. My mother took me to church for the first time when I was three weeks old, which I said would be normal because, you see, her dad was the preacher. That's right. My grandfather and my grandmother, who both raised me or helped raise me till I was about nine years old, then my mother remarried. We moved out of the house, but they continued to have a huge impact on my life. And when I say church was such a blessing, it was a blessing because I grew up hearing my grandfather preach and I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to preach like he preached. I wanted to people come to know Jesus like I saw people coming to know Jesus because of my grandfather's preaching. When I say that I learned some things that were correct and some things that were not correct, I mean, I, I grew up hearing Bible taught and my grandfather did the best that he could at the time that he had and the, and the education level that he had and the time that he spent in Bible and the environment in which he grew up. But there were some things, quite honestly, that he taught that were wrong. And later on, he changed his opinions on. He, ch he grew in his knowledge and was willing to change, which also had a huge impact on my life. I mean, I watched a man who had preached for over 60 years and even in his 80s, he changed some of his views, some of his very strong views. He discovered Bible taught something different than what he said Bible taught. Now, when I say the church had a big impact on my life, one of the reasons was because that's about all I heard about was church and church attendance. Christian life was defined as church attendance, doing five acts of worship, particularly paying attention to the sermon, but it involves singing and praying and giving and, and the fellowship and Bible study and, and all the rest, right, I, I, and communion. Those were important things. But my grandfather discovered in his 80s, he said this to me, he said, Bob, I think we've been teaching and preaching things wrong. I said, what do you mean, Gramps? And he said, what I mean is this. We have... I have, for most of my preaching life, preached the church of Christ. When I should have been preaching the church of Christ. See, our attention was so much on us and getting us right and doing things for us and having us, the church, is the focus of what God was all about when really God was all about focusing on His Son, Jesus. The whole Bible is about Jesus. All of the Old Testament, all of the prophets lead up to the birth and the life of Jesus. The last thing that God said publicly that other people heard and understood what he said was, this is my son. Listen to him. Now, that's pretty important. In fact, in Hebrews, it says that Jesus sat down at the right hand of God and the angels were told, you worship him. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than, than Joshua. He's greater than the law. He's greater than the tabernacle. He's greater than the priesthood. He's greater than all of the sacrifices. Jesus is superior to it all. God placed him above all else and we should too. But what we did, we placed the church above all else and not Christ. And I think we need to change that. And I thought, wow, my grandfather has made a huge change in his theological perspective. He, he saw things completely different and it radically changed. In fact, <laughs> about this time of year would be 
typically in just about any church you would attend, not outside the churches of Christ, of course, but any church you would attend, there'd be a Christmas message. We never had a Christmas message. Well, that, that's not exactly true. You see, we did have Christmas messages. My grandfather preached why it was wrong for us to celebrate Christmas as the birth of Christ. First of all, it is not the time of year that Jesus was born. The Bible doesn't tell us when Jesus was born. The Bible doesn't command the Christian nor give authority for the church to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So since we do only what the Bible gives authority for and only what God has commanded, we are not to worship as a church or not to celebrate the birth of Christ as a church. And that's the Christmas message for me was why we don't celebrate Christmas. Again, it was in his 80s, maybe closer to when he was almost 90. He died at 94 years old, which is kind of unusual. Many people don't live that long. My grandmother, my great-grandmother, his mother, lived to be 98 years old. My grandfather died at 94. He married a woman who, my grandmother, died at 100 years and 43 days. Longevity is in my genes. I mean, I'm gonna live a long time unless I end up in some kind of an accident or, or sickness that, that takes me away. Of course, I could die immediately with an aneurysm or a heart attack, who knows? But I'm just saying, longevity is in our family. Um, probably because he was very obedient to his parents as he was growing up and on that basis, Mm, I may not have much longer. <laughs> okay, but my grandfather changed his view about Christmas in his late 80s. And he decided that it was okay if you wanted to celebrate Christmas. He based that in Romans chapter 14. One person is more, to one person, one holy day is more important than all the others. And to the more mature or the, the stronger, every day is holy unto the Lord. Well, by that, he concluded that if you wanted to celebrate Christmas as the birth of Jesus, that's fine. See, he was in his 80s, late 80s, when he preached his first true Christmas message. And that was this. What he told me was, Bob, I just preached my first Christmas message yesterday. And I said, really, what'd you preach about? And he said, well, I said, isn't it interesting that, uh, that we celebrate this day often as the world and many churches do as the birth of Jesus. Have you ever gone to someone's birthday party where everyone gave each other presents but they never gave the person whose birthday it is presents? I mean, here we are celebrating his birthday by giving each other presents. Hmm. Now, if it is somebody's birthday and we're going to celebrate their birthday, we should be giving that person presents. But you know how hard it is to shop for someone who literally has everything? <laughs> so what is it that you could give Jesus on his birthday that he would really want? i tell you what it is. Jesus wants you. He wants you to give you to him on his birthday, to surrender your heart, your mind, your life to him. And what better time to do that than on the day we celebrate as his birthday? So my question to you is this, what are you going to give Jesus on his birthday? I thought, that is incredible. My grandfather in his late eighties, again, has made a major shift in his thinking. Now, as I proclaim a message to you today, I'm gonna to be focused on two passages of scripture that I hope is going to at least cause you to do a bit of thinking and a challenge to you to live out the relationship that you have with Jesus in a different way, that you perceive the world in a different way, that you perceive God in a different way, and so by that you perceive yourself in a different way. And because of that, you will act and live and think and have attitudes and values differently than what you have now. In other words, you'll grow, you'll change, you'll develop more to be like Jesus in every way. Now, today's lesson is all about the incarnation. Now, it's not a Christmas message per se. I'm not going to be looking at the birth of Jesus and them traveling the far distance from, um, from Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem. No, that was a big distance, especially when you're about eight months pregnant and it takes you that long to journey on a donkey, on a donkey's back, as Mary probably had to ride, or in the back of a wagon sometimes, and that's not easy. I mean, it's hard enough today in an airplane or in a car or a wagon, a van. I mean, it is difficult to travel today for a pregnant woman to say eight, seven, eight months pregnant. But Mary did. Joseph and Mary 
traveled a very long distance. But seriously, it wasn't as long of a distance as what Jesus himself traveled. Now, the, past, the first passage of Scripture we're going to be looking at is in Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. And the reason we're looking at this is because of the application. We're going to be looking at the incarnation model that Jesus himself left heaven, came into this world, became one of us, lived as we lived, or as we are living, and faced everything that we face, and yet he did not sin voluntarily gave his life as sacrifice to God to take the heat, to take the wrath of God off of us and onto himself, to make an exchange, his holy life for our unholy life, so that through his death and burial and resurrection, he made offer us our own death, burial with him, and resurrection into a new life, a whole new life with a whole fresh start, a totally clean slate, a perfect 10 relationship with God. And when we have that and we recognize the model, the, the, the model that Jesus gave in the incarnation, we also recognize that that's what God has called us to do in our own lives. But now let me start off with this. There is no way you can apply this message without the work of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. You cannot do this on your own power. There are a lot of commandments in the Bible that I believe that you can obey, but you cannot do what this is talking about without the help of the Holy Spirit of God. Watch. Philippians chapter 2, begin in verse 1. So, if there is any encouragement... This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort or strengthening from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Watch. Do nothing. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than you do yourselves. Let each of us look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You say, that is an impossible set of commandments. And you're right, apart from the help of the Holy Spirit of God. What he said is this, Think of others, consider others more important than yourself. Now, you recognize you are important, right? You do understand, you have tremendous value before God. So do other people. And what Paul is challenging us to do through 2,000 years of application in the scripture, what he wants us to do is this. Though we are equal with one another, he asks us to, he commands us to, view the other person as more important. Not to be looking at the other person as someone to be used, as a relationship to be gained for selfish benefit, to do something for them with any strings attached that they might do something back for us, but rather we would take the position of humility and think of others and consider others not only better than ourselves, that's what he says, but also that we would meet their needs not just look after our own interest, which we should do, we need to do. You do look after your own interest. But when it comes to your interest and the interests of others that you genuinely love, give up your own for the sake of theirs. How do you do that? I mean, like you said, that seems to be impossible. Well, it would be, except for this, the rest of the scripture. In verse five, he says, have this mind, another word for that would be have the same attitude, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So we start off with the basis that there's nothing that God is going to ask you to do that he hasn't already given you the power to do, number one. Number two, there's nothing he's going to ask you to do that he himself has not already done. Both of those are true. 
God himself has done what he's commanded us to do. And then he put his Holy Spirit to live inside of us when we became a Christian. Don't you remember the day when you said to Jesus, I want to give you my life. I want, I want forgiveness, Lord. I want to be saved. I want a relationship with God. I want him to be my father. I want to be a child. I want to be part of the family. I want to be a citizen in your kingdom. I don't know what you were thinking completely about the time that you became a Christian. Some of those things were in my mind, but the most important thing was this. I want to belong to you, Jesus. I want a relationship with you. I love you more than I love my life. And on that basis, I was dead to my own life. I died to sin. What I, in essence, said to sin, you're not going to rule me anymore. Jesus, I want you to rule me now. And being dead, what do we do with the dead person? That's right, we bury him. So when you were buried under water, that's what baptism is, when you were buried under the water and raised up again, there was a spiritual activity that took place. God placed his spirit inside of you and through his spirit gave you new life, washed your sins away, making you a whole new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All of the old is gone. Everything has become new. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. What's important about that is this. Jesus made the exchange. The Holy One for the unholy one. Huh, for the unholy ones. He made the exchange. The perfect one for the imperfect ones. He made the exchange. He took our sins into his own body and died as if he committed all of those sins. Be humble. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind in you that which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of of a king, of a boss, of the master. No. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a, this is what it says, of a servant, a slave, actually a bond slave, one who's been bought and paid for, has no rights at all. He took on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself. It wasn't just humbling to become a human. He even humbled himself to become a servant, to become obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Pause for just a moment. I want you to consider this. I suggested to you that Mary and Joseph traveled a very long way to go from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. <laughs> but Jesus traveled a much longer distance from equality with God, that he did not consider that equality something to be grasped and held onto. This is what that would look like. No, I'm not letting go. I will not let go. I am God, and I deserve to be served. I deserve to be loved. I deserve to be honored. I deserve to be worshiped. I will not let go. He didn't consider equality with God, something to be grasped and held onto with lighted knuckles, but rather emptied himself, became a human being, lived among us as a human being, weak, broken body, yet he, he suffered in every way like we. He was tempted it means he had the desire to do wrong, and yet he didn't do it. He had the desire not to do the thing that God called him to do, and yet he did. Yes, he was tempted in every way like we are, yet he was without sin. And he became obedient, not only became a, a human being, he became a servant. Not only a servant, he became obedient in everything, even to death. And then Paul takes just a moment, I think, he catches his breath and he says, even death on a cross. Now that in the first century, the cross 
was a point of great humiliation, pain, suffering, physically. You were stripped naked. You were beaten. In this case, he was scourged with a cat of nine tails. He was scourged. He was left almost dead. He carried his own cross through the city of Jerusalem. He was nailed to the cross, and he hung six hours outside the city of Jerusalem, hanging in pain, suffocating to death, suffocating to death, and bleeding. And he, and he did it for you. He humbled himself to become completely obedient. Father, I'm asking you, please take this cup away from me. I don't want to go through with this, but your will, not my will, be done. He was completely obedient, even to death, even death on a cross. The cross was reserved for the ones who were rebels against Rome, insurrectionists. That's what they charged Jesus with. He has put himself up equal to the king, emperor, Caesar. And the people of Israel said, we have no king but Caesar. What do you want me to do with your king? Crucify him. So the rejection that Jesus suffered was one. That was huge, hugely emotional. Then the beating, terrible physical beating. Then the nailing to the cross, the humiliation of hanging outside the city naked and in, and in shame and in pain. And not only that, all of our sins funneled into his body and he suffered as if he committed every one of those sins, guilty. As we are charged, he as the guilty one for the guilt of the sin so that we could be washed completely clean. He took our place. The distance that he traveled would have been like this. The beauty and the glory of, of God. He had all of it. Infinite love, infinite holiness, infinite creator, infinite power. And he emptied himself. He emptied himself in the human form. And became a man. And he lived among us in a broken, fallen vessel, a human body. He died on a cross. And so Paul says the next word, so important, therefore, therefore, because of all of that, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and, every, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How is it that you and I will ever have a life of humility where we become the servant of all? It is, first of all, recognizing what Jesus has already done for us and in us. And then from that position, did you notice this? As far as he was concerned, he, God, the one God made of three individuals who we now refer to as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They've taken the roles as Father, Son, Holy Spirit with respect to our understanding of their relationship. And Jesus, one of the equal Godhead, totally God, 100% God, emptied himself and chose to be Son, allowing Father to be over him. The Spirit submitted himself to be sent by the Father and the Son into the believers to live inside of us so that Jesus himself could have a body on this earth to live out all over the earth what he lived in the Palestinian region for a very short period of time. Now, he's in his church, his body, which is the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians chapter 1, the very last verse. What I'm saying is this. Jesus emptied himself. Now, he was equal with God, and he voluntarily considered God as Father, he as Son. 
a change of perspective, a change in reality. He viewed God this way, so he acted toward God this way. He, the God-man, the surrendered one, the emptied one, the humble one, the servant one, the obedient one, the one who would be nailed to the cross and died, the dead one, who would be dependent upon God the Father to raise him up from the dead. Yes, this Jesus is our model, so that we, who, you and I, you're watching this today, we are totally equal. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what color I am. I don't care where you're from. I don't care where I'm from. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what I've done. I don't care where you've slept or who you've slept with. I don't care where I've slept. I'm telling you this. We are equal. Totally. In value before God, we all, every human being, born and unborn. Yes, I said it. Born and unborn, we stand with an equal value to God who gave us life, who made us like himself. We are the image bearers of God himself. And God so loved the world. He loved the world in such a way that he gave his son that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. See, God didn't send his son to condemn the world. He sent his son to save us. And if you put your trust in him, if you walk with him, trusting Jesus to live in you and through you, to give you life, to forgive your sins, to enable you to live the way God designed you to live, if you live that life in him, then you stand uncondemned. You're in Christ. You're forgiven. You have Jesus has a perfect 10 relationship with God, and he offers that to you. Now, you being equal to others, you do exactly what Jesus did. He didn't count equality, something to be grasped. He didn't say, no, everyone has to serve me. He, the God of the universe, the creator of all, came into this world and became the servant, not only of God, but of us. <laughs> he became our servant and a sacrifice. And so he calls us. This is the introduction to the next lesson, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where Again, the same author of this passage of Scripture calls us to a life as living sacrifices, that we continually present ourselves as living sacrifices. This is the foundation for that lesson. So I hope you'll tune in. I hope you'll connect with me on that lesson as well. But has this encouraged you at all? Has it helped you see, has it helped you see the model of incarnation for us to live a life of service with each other? The church, serving one another, loving one another, giving to one another, helping each other carry needs and burdens, and going through the pain of life and celebrating the joys of life together. Yes, that's what the body of Christ is all about. Because we will sacrifice ourselves for each other because we follow the sacrificed one. And because you're willing to do that, God, because you're willing to be humble, God will one day exalt you. That's the promise of Scripture. You do what Jesus did, you'll receive what Jesus received. An exaltation. I'm not saying you're going to end up being God. That's just in case. But we're going to be like Jesus in some way. Jesus is still the man God, the God man, Jesus the Christ. And in some way, he's going to, as he raises us from the dead, we're going to experience eternity with him as he is, so we will be. That's why we purify ourselves. 1 John chapter 3, the first three verses. Go back and see if that's still in your Bible. I bet it is. Okay, this passage of Scripture challenges me in this way. Number one, I need to look at others with extreme value. Number two, I need to empty myself like Jesus did and become a servant. I need to take on the position of servant and consider others more valuable, more significant, and look after their needs. And when it comes to choosing between the needs of others and my needs, yes, in those cases where God has called me to sacrifice, I'll do that. Brothers and sisters, this is what God is calling us to do, and in this way, there can be peace. And we're to do so, as the next verse says, without complaining and grumbling. That's worth looking at too someday, isn't it? Would you pray with me as we conclude this message? Lord, 
thank you for breaking into our world, for breaking into our lives and revealing who God is. Thank you for giving your life for us. Thank you for going to the grave. Thank you for experiencing the totality of weakness, even to the point of death, dead for three days, physically dead and buried. Thank you, Holy Spirit for demonstrating he is truly the Son of God by raising him from the dead. And thank you, Jesus, for the life that you give to us by your resurrection and the spirit you give to us so that we can live out what you put in, your love, your peace, your joy. Thank you. I pray that you will help us to apply these things to our lives in a way that will bring you the greatest glory. For it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for being a part of this message from the Word of God.